Okay, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm honored to declare the public hearing number 19 open about the balance of the human rights defenders in Peru requested by the National Coordinator of Human Rights. So warm greetings to the representation of the civil society as well as to the representatives of the state. I have the honor of having here with me my colleagues, Commissioner Esmeralda, Commissioner Joel, Commissioner Estuardo, who is also the rapporteur for the country, and Joel, who is the rapporteur for human rights defender. Defenders. We also have our executive, our interim executive secretary, Maria Claudia Pulido, and the methodology for today will be 20 minutes for the civil society, 20 minutes for the state, then 20 min minutes for the Inter-American Commission, then we'll have comments by the civil society and the state, 12 minutes each, and finally the closure by the Inter-American Commission. My name is Flavia Piovesan. I'm the second vice president of the commission. On behalf of the Inter-American Commission, I'll give the floor to the GIFT Civil Society. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Katerina Parques Quispe. I'm Quechua. I'm a defender of Air Drives International as part of the subgroup who are defenders for human rights of the National Coordinator for Human Rights, we would like to thank the Commission for having granted us the possibility of being here in this hearing, which was requested because of the crisis of the rights of the human rights situation in Peru. The goal of this hearing is to raise awareness about the serious situation of human rights defenders in Peru, the double vulnerability that we are going through with the pandemic, and the lack of efficiency of the protocol that was approved in Peru. Therefore, we will explain how the Peruvian state has not complied with the prevention and protection obligations for human rights defenders. And finally, we would like to ask or to make some requests about concrete measures that the Peruvian state should adopt in order to address this problem from human rights perspective. Therefore, I will give the floor to the human rights defenders themselves who will give their testimonies of this problem. Therefore, I'll give the floor to Marisol. Ajima Chishi, members of the, of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights, my name is Maria, La Maria Marisol Fepiquecha. I'm part of the um, Peruvian Amazonia region. The indigenous peoples cannot continue living discriminated and forgotten by the state. When we go to Yurimagua city to denounce the cases of illegal felling of trees and land trafficking, we don't have access to justice because our cases are always filed left aside. Making these complaints is very expensive and it takes more than 12 hours taking a boat, a bus. The leaders of our community were kidnapped and seriously hurt in 2018. The saddest part of it all is that the prosecutor's office, office left our case aside. That's why, commissioners, we are living under threats for these kind of complaints for more than five years. In August 2020, we requested the reactivation of the protocol for human rights defenders. And on February the 8th, the Ministry of Justice accepted our case. It is very sad that they've taken more than six months and not 10 days, as the regulation says, for serious cases as this one. However, the Peruvian state, the activation of the protocol is useless because they only give advice to the give notice to the police, but the police is not helping us. We know that Bimbajo, there has no police department. The intelligence service called it a, a, an area in turmoil, but nothing came. There has been no authorities that came to visit us. 
everything is just written in writing in paper. Therefore, commissioners, I'm exposing my life by making this complaint. As a woman who is a human rights defender and mother of my children, it's been very difficult for me to make my voice be heard among the authorities, among so many men. The Peruvian state is not valuing our work and they are not addressing the true issues. The lack of legal security in our land, the delay and the corruption of the regional government, all of that is making us vulnerable for people coming to our lands. They are violating our rights and the state is not taking care of our rights. We are the Quechua community. We are protecting the trees and the water for the sake of all the community and for the sake of all, all mankind. I want justice for my indigenous comrades that, are, that have been killed. No more corruption, no more impunity. Now I'll give the floor to Edivar. Good afternoon, members of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. My name is Edivar Carrasco Vázquez. I represent the peasants community of Santa Catalina, the Ambayeque region of Peru. Our community owns the Acebe Chaparrín Reserve. The community, our community, has already suffered from criminalization, acts, defamation, and deaths killings since 2014. The people responsible of these facts are linked to land trafficking and people related to the government that are interested in creating a hydraulic project within our reserve. Since 2014, people that do not belong to our community have come, I'm sorry, his audio is breaking. They got hold of part of our community. From that year onwards, there have been um, expropriation of lands from promoted by uh, businessmen and by other people that do not belong to, uh, to people from our community and our comrades are expelled from their lands. After the creation of the hydraulic plan, mainly La Monteria Dam, they started Grabbing lands, many of that we conducted, therefore, are filed and are just left aside by the prosecutor's office, even if they can prove that there is an environmental crime. With, in terms of the criminal complaints that we presented and we filed, people such as the brother of Marco Antonio Diaz Castillo, because of the grabbing of lands, they increased the threats against myself in this case, there have been attacks since 2016, there have been more grabbing of land, more fires in the forests of Chaparri. Since 2016, there have been uh, complaints against people here and they've threatened to death some of our comrades. In 2017, the governor, who used to be an environmental defender himself as well, they were denounced and threatened to death. And in December uh, 2017, they killed our lieutenant governor, Tarriba Bonica. An average of 30 environmental defenders that were denounced, and six of whom have statements against, they are asking for reparation, even if the prosecutor could not prove if this was true or not, and they couldn't find any damage, the threats to death against the environmental defenders continue to date. After one year and seven and five months, the protocol has been activated, but as a matter of fact, the protocol is not truly working. I've been threatened to death, and I've had three attempts of murder. In the second attempt, I contacted the police, and even if I was five minutes away from the police station, they arrived one hour and 45 minutes later. Since I got the information of the protocol, 
his audio is breaking, I apologize. It was not communicated, and so far the police is not doesn't receive any reports in this regard, and that's why they perhaps do not act immediately. Thank you. I'll give the floor to my next to the next colleague. My name is Freddy Yaike. I'm a member of the Committee of Espina from the region of Cusco, Peru. And I would like to thank you, first of all, to thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. I would like to denounce and to complain and show my indignation because the authorities do not enforce the protocols to ensure the protection of human rights defenders in Peru. In Espinar, Cusco, there are, we've been living for 40 years with a trans mining process or project. The mining company has not been responsible in terms of the environment, the health, and they've created poverty, inequality, social problems, and they have violated human rights. In 2020, last year, because of the declaration of emergency of the state because of COVID-19, we asked the mining company that within the framework agreement that they might invest some of the money that they are using in order to in order to give a solidarity bonus or or grant to all the community because of the pandemic they didn't agree with that therefore because of the lack because of the lack of acceptance of the mining company we started making our demonstrations. At that time, the public ministry of Peru, by means of the prosecutor's office, started denouncing us, persecuting us, threatening us, intimidating us, sending us threatening messages to our cell phones, among many other things. While we were doing our strike because of our rights, the police force forces attacked us grabbing people that were coming back home, young people mainly. And men and women, young men and women were hit. They had fractures or broken bones and they got stolen. And not only that, after this act, the policemen got into the city. They were shooting lacrimogenous gases. And Facing this fact, I would like to point out something important. We've presented to the Ministry of Justice a request for protection within the framework of the resolution 159-2019 from the Ministry of Justice so that our, this protocol might be respected and so to ensure the security of human rights defenders in our land. We've presented this in July 2020 and up to Today, we have not received any kind of answer whatsoever. We don't have any answers. We don't know whether they are accepting or denying our request. This is ongoing. This has been already almost eight months since we made the, the original request. The prosecutor's office here in Peru continues sending us notifications in this case so that right to demonstration. In Peru, we have the right to freedom of expression, a freedom of association, of opinion, and to defend our constitutional rights. The prosecutor's office, without making any kind of research or investigation, has charged us with things such as saying that we do not allow the public services to work as they should, turmoil, resistance, disobedience to the authorities, among others. Therefore, we are, we are really worried and concerned because we are being criminalized. Therefore, by means of the Inter-American Commission, I ask for justice for the population of our province in Cusco, in Peru, because our authorities are not listening to us. They are paying no attention to our requests. Therefore, I leave it at your hands, at the hands of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, so that in this opportunity, you can intervene in favor of our province of Espinar, Cusco, in Peru. Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, commissioners. My name is Ayesha Davila, a social communicator, feminist fan activist, and a mother. This afternoon, in addition to those who are defending their own lives and their territories, the defenders of equality and women's rights are here. We are the same people who are facing the harshest ideologies, ideologies, the ones that want our rights to disappear and to continue fostering discrimination and machism. The advocacy work that we conduct, we have been conducting this for several years and it has allowed us to continue um, fostering equality in terms of sexual education in, in public education. But still, these rights are not applied. Unlike our brothers and sisters, our lives are not threatened, or at least not threatened yet, but our rights are threatened. Same thing as being left aside, same thing as happens with environmental rights. They've registered our names as their own names, they've left us aside. We've received lawsuits so that we couldn't continue working, favoring what we are doing. They are trying to make us disappear from the legal sphere so as to force us to go backwards in our struggle. They will not manage to do so, however. We've suffered many ways of being attacked since 2018. For example, the exposure of our personal information, our children's data, defamation on uh, the social media. Um, we've been harassed and we've received different letters, threatening letters, where they say that they're going to denounce us if we continue uh, doing our conducting our struggles. Therefore, We've decided, a group of us has decided in November 2019 to send a, a request for the activation of the protocol to defend the defenders. After a year, they've answered and they said that they were going to make a risk assessment on us and therefore afterwards to activate the protocol. They asked and the measures they gave given us are not enough they have not even been enforced or made effective. Therefore, this afternoon, as the defenders of sexual rights, reproductive rights and women, we ask the following, that these processes might be shorter and that impl they implement measures focused on this, such as, for example, the administrative delays or the administrative cases. And that they also think of measures to counterattack, to cut, to counteract other attacks when the compliance of the public policies that should protect actually the, the mistreatment that women feel. We also ask for legal support, not only for criminal cases, but also for administrative cases. The defense, public defense is a right of every human, of every human being. And the defenders are not just any citizens. Human rights defenders are the ones who take these tasks forward to compensate for the lacks of the state. Therefore, the state at least should protect us or should make sure that we are protected and that we have the conditions to continue making our job, making our work. And we ask for acknowledgement, public acknowledgement to human rights defenders, which is necessary, because that is the way in which we can ensure that we are getting support from the Ministry of Justice. This could somehow reduce the attacks and the threats that we are receiving. I thank you for the attention and for the space that you're giving us. And I do believe that the protocol of my country might be soon implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, commissioners. Uh, your the statements that we listened to uh, show that there are limitations in the implementation of the protocol for human rights defenders. The state committee to create in 2021 a mechanism that uh, articulates all the sectors uh, until that commitment is a reality. There are many things that could be done that could be done. And we have some specific uh, requests. The first, we need the protocol to have a, an approach uh, based on risk reduction. We need to have a follow-up regarding the effective implementation of the protection measures there. We also request 
uh, more flexibility in the determination of protection measures. For example, uh, he invaders should know that there are protocol measures that are being implemented. And as a result, those measures were not implemented because they were not communicated. We also uh, request the promotion of the uh, protection measures. This could help reduce the levels of risk. There should be a reduction in uh, time responses. The average now is 10 months when the regulation says that it should be 10 days. We need to request also at, uh, measures, protection measures for those attacks that go not only against life. Criminalization is also a problem and the protocol should take into consideration the risk faced by human rights defenders in the country. It's impossible to believe that the journalist that is uh, the most important in Peru, uh, that they have, she has been told that she had to wait for the protocol. Uh, the protocol should include all the topics, everything that has to do with drug trafficking and all the structural issues in order to address the situations. And for therefore, therefore there should be the, uh, an adequate budget. Uh, uh, as for now, the civil society organizations are the ones that are protecting the leaders. Uh, and also uh, the of public officials should be the leaders and should be implementing the protection measures. And this will lead uh, to other sectors all also implementing these measures. We also request the strengthening the preventive measures of the protocol. There are many things that can be done, uh, even though some, uh, uh, even those requ uh, protection requests are not sent. Uh, we also demand a more active role uh, not all peasants organizations and indigenous people's organizations have the knowledge to, comp to complete or to fulfill the request or the forms. There should be help so that all everyone can access the mechanism in a timely way. Thank you very much. Thank you, civil society organizations, for your valuable participation. Now I will give the floor to the state the representatives of the state of Peru. Please, you have the floor. Good morning. Good morning, uh, commissioners, ladies and gentlemen, and also to the petitioners of this thematic hearing. My name is Gonzalo Villani. I'm the director of the Ministry of Human Rights at Peru. Uh, first, I will, on behalf of the state of Peru, I would like to communicate our apologies and for the leaders that have been killed. Um, it's uh, a shame that because they are human rights defenders, they have been murdered or they are suffering attacks and threats. That's why we value this opportunity to promote dialogue so as to identify challenges and those pending issues. I would also like to mention that there is, the state is willing to protect and to promote human rights defenders and their work. And therefore, in this thematic hearing, um, the following people will participate. Carlos Rodriguez Gomez, direct, General Director of Human Rights of the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights. Mrs. Ines Martins Morines, that is the General Director of Democratic Security of the Ministry of Interior. Mr. Mariano Castro Sanchez Moreno, that is Vice, Mesir, Vice uh, President of the Ministry of the Environment. And also uh, Mrs. Uh, Soila, that is uh, in charge of uh, citizen uh, protection. And then uh, Mr. Espinosa, that is a coordinator of the Office of the Prosecutor regarding crimes uh, uh, against uh, humanity and human rights. I would like to give the floor to Mrs. Rod Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you very much. We are here in this hearing because we are genuinely interested uh, in listening to those who requested it. Uh, 
and we would like to listen to the recommendations and the observations that uh, made by the Distinguished Inter-American Commission. We would like to mention the actions prepared and implemented by the state of Peru uh, uh, in order to advance on the policies for the protection of human rights defenders and also the improvement of some specific instruments. Three years have uh, gone by since the approval of the National Plan for Human Rights, and this element included for the first time human rights defenders as a group that requires special protection. Within three years, in a progressive way and in a participatory way, we have adopted all the actions included in the plan. They include regulations and public policies. In 2019, the protocol to guarantee the protection of human rights defenders was approved. The process of approval included civil society organizations and state agencies together with labor unions and companies. In 2020, the record of uh, complaints and incidents of uh, and situations of human rights defenders was approved. The tool is aimed at collecting information in order to adopt prevention measures. And it was approved with the participation of the state civil society organizations and companies. Uh, up to date, the state is about to approve or to pass the decree that creates a mechanism for the protection of human rights defenders. It includes principles, measures, and guidelines for the protection and the access to justice of human rights defenders that are in a risk situation due to their work. Uh, we would like to have uh, the contributions of civil society organizations, and we had them. The mechanism uh, is a result of the assessment of the protocol as the starting point. Uh, we understand that there are inefficacies regarding the reach to the beneficiaries. An intersectoral mechanism would help us to have a better dialogue between institutions in order to have a strengthening mechanisms. Also, we would like to have deadlines that are shortened and that determine on emergencies. And all this will be based on experience at an institutional level. The Ministry of Justice and Human Rights prepare a team of specialists uh, regarding the implementation of the protocol within the section of human rights. Uh, this uh, group only uh, work on the design of public policies, but now it offers a service of emergencies that coordinates responses to emergency situations and emergency cases. Not only those situations where there is a request by civil society, by civil society organizations and human rights defenders, but also by any person that send an email or call and that because of the level of response, all these cases request an emergency response. Between uh, March and June 2020, uh, the specialized team received uh, many uh, early warning calls. 11 belong to the first year, 18 to the last 10 months of the protocol. The protocol is more and more used. The load, the burden is, has tripled and the group has become stronger and bigger. Some uh, four, uh, of the requests uh, presented were rejected and the other 10 are in process. Out of those requests under a study, in six of them, there had been prevention measures in order to guarantee uh, legal protection. They have, for the rest of the requests, we have uh, conducted interviews in order to determine if it's necessary to provide attention because of the presence of an imminent risk. Of all the requests that have been accepted, uh, uh, for 11 of them, the risks have been evaluated and the relevant emergency early warnings have been sent. All this articulation will be done together with a stronger mechanism in which uh, defense activities or human rights defenders activities the state should pay a special, uh, should make a special emphasis. 10 of the requests have to do with the defense of indigenous peoples and eight have to do with uh, environmental defenders. 
So we have 18 requests and we know that these activities lead to uh, urgent risks and serious risks. Uh, also, the two requests that have to do with the defense of the gender approach in education, also the defense of human rights. Also, there is another request regarding labor rights. There is another request regarding LGBTI persons, one regarding gender equality, another regarding freedom of expression. There is also regarding the right to property. The other has to do with mobility or human mobility. The other has to do with the defense against corruption. We know that the risk situations are everywhere across the country because we verify that there are attacks and threats against human rights defenders, especially in those requests or those 11 requests that requested an early warning uh, alert or alert. Those requests the work of coordinated work of the different departments or states we have in Pew and Lima and Cusco and Amazonas everywhere. It is clear that in the Amazonas region, we have six alerts that are activated. So we need to improve our effectiveness there. There are six risk situations that affect the defense of human rights defenders, especially for indigenous peoples, especially one, two regarding environmental rights, other regarding peasants communities, other regarding the rights of women and other regarding the uh, reports against corruption. Most, uh, most of the demands come from the peoples in the Amazonia and in the Andes. Um, uh, the improvement of the work will help to implement the mechanism everywhere in spite of the weaknesses. The protocol is a sector uh, target um, tool the Ministry of Justice and Human Rights has been able to work together with the National Police and the Ministry of the Interior to implement urgent actions of protection in those cases where there could be a risk uh, regarding the life or the freedom of human rights defenders. We have provided them uh, security uh, for those special security measures for them. I will give the floor to my colleague Ines Hichel to share some details. Good afternoon, commissioners, representatives of civil society organizations, and participants, citizens. Today's topic is very important. We regret the attacks that you have suffered and that you are suffering as human rights defenders. We would like to send our condolences to the family members for their losses. The Ministry of the Interior is the uh, government agency that has a national coverage. It, within its functions, it evaluates the functioning of the National Police of Peru and it coordinates with that agency the necessary actions of intervention to guarantee citizen security according to the established policies. Within the context, the National Police of Peru regarding after the regulations that request the activation of the early warning or alert uses different me prevention measures and surveillance measures in the context of threats against human rights defenders in order to protect these people. Also, the general direction of the Ministry of the Interior through the section of special authorizations together with the different military offices at a national level provides special measures of protections for those who request them in situations that risk their integrity and their life. Regarding the actions of the police after the activation of the early alerts, the staff of the police stations of the sector uh, go to the place where the things or the uh, facts have occurred in order to identify the situation. Then they communicate with the Ministry of the Interior in order for the requested actions to be implemented. This is the way that in which the Ministry of the Interior is able to collect all the information and the evidence requested within the framework of a prosecutor investigation. The public prosecutor office together with intelligence unit collect information in order to identify and to capture the alleged perpetrators of the different crimes uh, in the jurisdiction of the police station of the place where the facts have taken place. We know that training is 
crucial for the better working of the state mechanisms. I should say that the Minister of the Interior through the General Direction of city, uh, the Democratic Security has work, been working with the Minister of Justice and Human Rights to uh, promote a course regarding situation of human rights defenders and their protection in risk situations. It will reach uh, over 6,500 uh, police officers in different jurisdictions. And this will also include those who work in rural police stations. In addition, as of 2020, the specific uh, thematic regarding the protection of human rights defenders has been included in all training sessions for the education of human rights specialists and experts across the country. And this will be part of the training of the uh, staff. We understand this sectorial and the importance of working in an interticulated way. And therefore, I will give the floor to the Vice Minister of Environmental Management of the State of Peru. Uh, your mic is on mute. Sorry. And thank you, Dr. Martins. First of all, I would like to send my condolences onto the family members and the colleagues of the human rights defenders that have been murdered. We reject and we condemn uh, those murders. Commissioners, representatives of civil society organizations, and the audience that are participating in this hearing through social media. I would like to say the following. First, I would like to talk about human rights defenders, especially those that are environmental defenders. We understand from our ministry that they are persons that in a peaceful way dedicate to promote a sustainable and healthy environment. And therefore, a state should adopt the necessary measures to recognize, protect, and promote their rights in line with has been established in international instruments in the area of human rights. For example, the Declaration of Human Rights and the different rulings issued by the Inter-American Court in the matter. Taking into consideration that perspective, we believe that it's important to highlight that illegal activities that have a bigger impact on the well-being of persons and the environment, especially in the Amazonas, especially illegal mining uh, is one of the activities that creates an impact on the ecosystems, but also compromise the life and the integrity of the citizens that have devoted their lives to preserve the environment. In recent years, we have experienced as a country a significant increase of cases related to environmental rights. 60% of those cases are activities that include the legal exploitation of natural resources. And these are part of a bigger context of illegal crimes that include uh, human trafficking, uh, uh, gun trafficking, and these endangers those who are uh, dedicated to the protection of the environment. To create the functional department, which will be focused mainly on the prevention, that is to say, creating strategic analysis of information so that we can make the most of that, including the regulatory framework, and so that they can help the environmental issue. Our goal is also to join the work of the environmental entities on the one hand with the entities that are part of the justice administration. The goal is to work in a more articulated manner to join efforts and to try and join efforts to foster or to address these issues. We would like 
also to contribute to the measures for acknowledgement and for the protection of human rights defenders. In that sense, the environmental the environment ministry will foster activities to acknowledge the contribution that environmental defenders do in favor of the environment and the strengthening of the environmental state and conditions in Peru. We'll create annual reports following the regulations determined by the entity, public acknowledgement and activities, acknowledging the importance of the role of environmental defenders. In terms of protection, we will coordinate with the departments and agencies analyzing the protected areas of Peru so as to protect environment, environmental defenders. And we will adopt measures of environmental supervision in order to pay attention to the possible environmental risks as well as to the rights of the defenders. For that goal, we will approve the sector protocol that regulates the intervention of the environmental institutions with the aim of ensuring the protection and the rights of those defenders, as well as a roadmap to have access to environmental justice in Peru and establishing better cooperation relations with other entities that are autonomous, such as the ombudsman and the judicial power. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, members of the commission, we would like to ensure from the Ministry of the Environment in Peru, not only the right to a healthy and sustainable environment, but also to the fundamental rights that assist or that are paid to the uh, environmental defenders in general. Thank you. Thank you. So the state has one more minute if you want to use it. No, is it okay? So now I give the floor to the members of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, my colleagues. We will start by the rapporteur on this topic, on the topic of the environment and the environmental defenders. So Joel, I give the, the floor to you. Thank you, thank you, Flavia, um, for giving me the floor. First of all, I would like to greet all the, organ the civil society organizations as well as the authorities of the Peruvian state. This is an issue that the commission and the rapporteurship for human rights defenders has been following for some time now, following very closely, we've been taking down note for the analysis of the protocol for the defense of human rights defenders. And we've also accompanied the civil society in their concerns and their demands that they've sent to us, to the authorities, to ask for better protection. I would like to point out something positive in this regard that there will be a mechanism, an intersectional mechanism for human rights defenders that will be created soon. It is a very important step, the step that should be taken after the protocol. And therefore, this will be the institutional structure that will allow for a better enforcement or application of the protocol. Now, let me make reference to some of the things that we've heard and then we will, I will give the floor to the Vice President, Joves Piovesan. I believe, first of all, that it is very important to address the topic of risk prevention. The underlying risks to the attacks of, to human rights defenders make them, put them at a very vulnerable situation. It's been very important to listen to what the Vice Minister Mariano Castro has said about the actions that they are doing within the Environment Ministry in order to address these risk situations. However, I believe it is also very important to take into account that we should make an analysis of knowing what is the origin 
of many of these struggles that the environment defenders are conducting. Uh, the people who took the floor before were very eloquent in pointing out that they are fighting for minimum life conditions, that is to say water, land. And that puts them at a vulnerable situation as well, mainly when there are pending issues or, for example, the uh, limitation or restriction of land, because at the same time, there are extraction activities that do not comply with the 169 convention agreement, mainly when these activities are with economic purposes without making a prior consultation as established in the 169 convention. So these are risks that if we don't pay attention to, I mean, if we don't uh, address the structural causes, this will turn into a risk factor. And what happens usually? Very frequently, human rights defenders are criminalized because of their actions, because of their defense actions. And that's another of the vulnerability situations where many people find themselves. And I'm not only talking about Peru. This happens very frequently, that is to say, criminalization of the defensive actions. Therefore, I believe, I mean, these comments are, uh, are done with the aim of urging the authorities of Peru to actually have a deeper analysis of the root causes or underlying causes of why these actors are at risk so that these root causes can be addressed and then there are no longer these kind of risks posed to the defenders. A second element that I would like to point out is the importance of dialogue between the authorities and the civil society. I had the opportunity to be in Peru, in Lima, in the Ministry of Justice, and I could pick down note of the dialogue, of the existing dialogue between the Ministry of Justice and the civil society for the construction of this protocol that we mentioned, as well as for the subsequent actions. However, what we've heard here today are very specific concerns and legitimate concerns of the people involved. One of the concerns that was repeated the most is the time it takes to activate the preventive measures when the protocol actually says 10 days. And it's been pointed out that it took up to 10 months to activate it. Therefore, I believe it is essential based on the work that has been conducted already by the state, by the Ministry of Justice and by the civil society to go deeper into a deeper dialogue. I would like to know whether there is already an assessment mechanism to assess the protocol so that the situations, the ones that are presented here, might be voiced to the authorities and improvement measures might be taken. It is important that from a feedback, a mutual feedback and dialogue, we can improve the protection measures. It is clear that there are always situations that go beyond the willingness of the authorities. There are always uncertain things that or unexpected things, but it is important to improve the situation anyway. That's what I wanted to, to comment on. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Joel, for your contributions uh, in terms of the human rights defenders. Now I have the honor of uh, giving the floor to Commissioner Estuardo, the rapporteur for the country. Thank you, Madam President. Greetings to all my colleagues. And I would also like to greet the representatives of the civil society as well as the representatives of the state of Peru. I would like to start by sharing my feeling of uh, regretting, regretting the threats, the harassment, and to 
show my solidarity to the loss of lives that have been suffered, that has been suffered by some of the human rights defenders in Peru. I've taken down note of the concerns, of the complaints, of the requests that were made by you, by and also, I would like to point out, in terms of the participation of the state, I would like to point out the willingness that you've shown in order to promote dialogue and in order to find an improvement of the current mechanism. There are some questions that I would like to pose according to what was mentioned in the hearing so far. One of the questions is related to the functioning of the early alert systems that were mentioned on the one hand by the civil society, that when they requested some kind of support, there were delays or some of their petitions were just filed and left aside. So could you explain in a little bit further detail if there is any situation that could be improved or how that is working, how this system, this early alert system, how it is working? Is it something that will uh, come or improve with the intersectorial mechanisms that will be created? So that was the first question. Now, second question is related to the investigation of the, of the facts, that is to say, the threats, the harassment, the death of some human rights defenders, so that the, there will not be impunity on these facts. So the question is, how are you investigating or what is the relation with the prosecutor's office? Is there any specialized unit that is making a follow-up to these acts? And the third question is which protection measures or measure catalogs are being given to the people at the time when they realize that there is a risk upon a threat or upon a complaint, what is the, spe the specific answer that the state can give according to the level of the complaints received? Thank you so much for the information that you've given us, both parties. Thank you, Commissioner Estuardo, from the Rapporteur of the Country of Peru. Now I'll give the floor to Commissioner Esmeralda. So Esmeralda, you have the floor. Thank you, Commissioner Flavia and President of this hearing. My acknowledgement to all the representatives of the civil society, petitioners of this hearing, as well as an acknowledgement to the participation of the authorities of the state of Peru. I agree and I support the questions of my colleagues. I would only like to add two things. First of all, the reserve to, imply the, to apply the protocol. It has been pointed out by the civil society that in the face of the request, the request for protection or activation of the protocol, the first answer is to keep a kind of reluctance to not to use it, not to apply it. And I'm not sure why, what are the arguments or the reasons why they are, you are being reluctant to implement it. Um, it could, I mean, one of the explanations could be, for example, why the police is taking so long in providing the necessary protection. So that, that's one point to go uh, deeper into that topic. And the second point is the complaint about how the human rights defenders and environment defenders are criminalized, mainly while conducting their activities, that, that is to say, while defending their causes. They pointed out that they were being threatened, that they were denounced, 
and that the prosecutor, the prosecutor's office, even without enough proof or evidence, are bringing lawsuits to them. So I think that those were two, like, two clarifications that I would like to, to receive. And also, a call for dialogue as well. Um, if there is availability or the willingness of the state to try and find the best formula for to improve the implementation of the protocol and so that the protocol can be as effective as possible. That would be very useful and valuable because it is a bridge, a bridge in terms of communication, in terms of getting in touch with people as to us find or try and find joint solutions. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner Esmeralda. And I would also like to pose three questions uh, myself as well. First, as a rapporteur, for LGBTI people, I would like to know the protection measures taking into account the specific context of human rights defenders. We heard the protection to indigenous people, to sexual and reproductive rights. Uh, so I would like to know the clarification of these ones in particular. Second question. I think it is the right time to make a balance of the impact. I agree with what Esmeralda said before, the effectiveness of the protocol for the protection uh, of the human rights defenders. So it's been two years since uh, the first few steps to experiment on this protocol since that started. So I would like to understand the balance, the strengths on the one hand, the weaknesses on the other, because right now, uh, along this line, the organizations of the civil society ended their interventions with a petition. I, I wrote down seven proposals, all in all, having a protocol to measure the risk, greater flexibility for the measures, a lower time to get the response, non-criminalization. So out of these proposals, out of these seven proposals, I would like to know from the state how, to, how they can improve or to take into account the lessons learned, taking into account this protocol to the future, or that is to say, making a bridge from the uh, back, background to the prospective view. Now I'll give the floor, floor to the civil society. You have 12 minutes for any comments you would like to add. So they are, therefore you have the floor. Thank you, commissioners. Commissioners, based on the comments of the state of Peru, we would like to make two additional observations regarding the implementation of the protocol for human rights defenders. The protocol is not effective because the state of Peru has not adopted adequate measures with an intercultural approach. Uh, in spite of the fact that, as they have said, uh, human rights defenders usually are belong to indigenous peoples. Those are the ones that are at a greater risk. Uh, we uh, are surprised that we are hearing the condolences from the public officials when the state did not provide the right protection to human rights defenders. They have mentioned the legal protection for human rights defenders, but commissioners, what does it mean in Peru to give legal protection to a human rights defender? In Peru, that means even a resolution to tell that person that they will be protecting. But in practice, there is no action of protection for the defender. Why? Because we have received several responses because there are some, sometimes they told us that there is no police officers, there are no police officers that can go uh, to address emergencies. So there is no guarantee for human rights defenders and environmental defenders. And we would like to ask two questions and to say two things. The state has not learned nothing, but because they don't know that their protection is not effective. 
what is the situation of the territory of One Piece when there is no police station close to the territory and when there are, there are human rights defenders at a risk situation? Those are my questions for the state. Thank you very much. Commissioners, the protocol for human rights defenders in the state of Peru is useless. That's why we are being murdered. We call, we demand justice and I demand access to dignified justice. Stop giving away our territories. Let us have the legal uh, person, legal persons of our territories. That is what we want to be. They need to understand in Santa Rosia de Nayaya, there is no police station near the territory. How the police officer will protect us when they even tell us that this a situation is a place where they cannot work. My family is without protection. So what do we need to do? where we have we have to go we need to have effective preven prevention measures you give away our forest you sell them and as a result our head has a price right now we could be number eight because we have seven people that have been martyred so i demand justice they always say that there is no money, but there, are, there is money because former presidents of the state of Peru have pensions for their life. While we the, as human rights defenders and those who defend the forest and the water, we don't have access to justice. Stop closing our cases. We need concrete measures. I will give the floor to Adivar. The early alerts activation should stop being alert because, and they should be, very, we should be very careful when using them. I was uh, informed of an alert in January, but up to now the police officers are not aware of that alert. So I have no security at all. In my case, the police that is just five minutes away arrived an hour later when the perpetrators left in their second attempt to murder me. The, we are being criminalized. We are abandoned environmental defenders. The Office of the Prosecutor for Environmental Matters want to imprison environmental defenders of our community. That is the situation that we are facing. I think that Ediva lost connection. Can I continue? They are trying to imprison us. I will give the floor to my friend, Freddy. Thank you. I would like to thank once more the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Uh, the civil society has the floor, please. Thank you. So I am Freddy Yaike, and this time I also would like to show how concerned I am uh, regarding um, our authorities in Peru. In Peru, we have laws, we have regulations, we have a constitution regarding the defense of the person, the integrity and human rights. But I want to say this, unfortunately, those measures are not respected. Everything is rhetorical and everything is uh, in plans, but they are not executed. In my province, uh, most of my brothers belong to indigenous peoples. We need to say that our rights are being affected, violated, the right to life and to health. It's been eight months since we presented a protection action 
to the Ministry of Justice according to the Ministerial Resolution 59, 2019. And we haven't had any response, any reaction. They are not answering our request. The Ministry of Justice is not giving us a response. We have international treaties, we have the 169 convention from the ILO, but our authorities are ignoring this. It is very sad that the state of Peru is not respecting the protocol that they have ratified. We need that the rules and regulations are complied with, and we need sanctions for those who violate human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you again. I would like to uh, men uh, mention or to talk about the recommendations presented by Commissioner Hernandez regarding structural causes. In the case of structural causes uh, that affect women, make that the attacks that we suffer are not considered priority by the state. And as a result, we are victims of public officials. For example, there was a situation in November last year during the demonstrations to recover the democracy of our country. Two of our defenders, uh, while uh, exercising their rights to defend their human rights, were sexually abused by the police officers. This is because they were transferred to police stations without their consent in order to file a case against them. But this was just an abuse of power. So I would like to mention again this um, incident in November last year to back up the recommendation made by the Commissioner Hernandez regarding uh, the need to address the structural causes that go against the rights of women. And especially we need to work on prevention. Thank you. In order to use the time that we have left, I would like to mention some general aspects regarding the questions that have been presented to us. Regarding the assessment of the protocol, we are concerned uh, regarding the participation of the Ministry of Justice. They are talking about the requests that, they, that have been submitted that are under evaluation, while the goal of this hearing is to have an assessment that is not only quantitative, but also qualitative. We need for them to assess how useful the protocol is to reduce the situation of defenders. We hope and we demand the state to give us uh, results. We want the strengthening of the accountability system of the protocol. We need information. We want the state to work in order to analyze how useful the measures have been. Because what they have told us is that they have no obligation to follow up uh, regarding how the measures have been implemented and if they have been useful or not. Maybe they should be able to clarify this, please. And regarding the question regarding publicity, we as civil society organizations have to organize for Chaparrile press conference. Nobody from the state was during the conference in order to report that the protection measures were not there. Those protection measures are not secret, but that seems to be the actions of the Ministry of Justice. They communicate with the beneficiaries and with with some authorities, but they do not report about those measures on their website. Uh, for example, this is a procedure the Inter-American Commission uses when issuing or granting precautionary measures. There are also no information regarding the uh, measures taken by the police. One of the practices is to uh, also provide information to the perpetra perpetrators, but However, the Ministry of Justice is not implementing those, those types of reports. They are not using those reports. And the same happened with the 
Arab Syrian community that is also a beneficiary of precautionary measure by the commission. We would like to insist on the issue regarding structural measures. When you were talking about the catalog regarding protection measures, a good thing that happened with the creation of the protocol is that there is not a closed catalog. catalog. We have an open list of measures. So there shouldn't be any formal rejections so, uh, to the possibility of the protocol addressing the structural issues. For example, property titling, there is a common element. Many attacks against environmental defenders are related to property titling issues. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to civil society organizations now. With the, I will give 12 minutes to the representatives of the states to take the floor. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for giving us the opportunity. Uh, taking into consideration uh, the comments made by civil society organizations, I would like to give the floor uh, or to talk about the fact that the Office of the Public Prosecutor a uh, prosecutor has the duty to uh, provide uh, protection and prevention measures for human rights defenders and other groups of vulnerability according to the law of service and public defense and its regulation. The General Direction of Public Defense provides legal assistance and legal aid and victim protection services. And they are provided at the national level in 34 departments. And we have over 2,000 public officers in this area. Between 2019 and 2021, we have addressed several cases of violations of human rights defenders' rights. And we have been providing legal representation and assistance to at a legal or a judicial or police level. Regarding uh, the activation of the early alert process, uh, we are promoting human rights defenders from the different communities in Seringuanque, San Juan, Batista, San Biura, San Cla Santa Clara, among other communities. So we need to say that public defense or a public prosecutor office can only learn about the cases through the uh, social media, communication media, or through the citizens that call us to our free toll number. Uh, as a result of the work carried out together with the Secretary of Human Rights, we have been able to provide a quick response to the family members of indigenous leaders that have been uh, uh, elected a short time ago. So that relatives of the leaders are uh, assisted or legally assisted and have the right to access to justice. Um, we also need to mention that drug cases that have been uh, dealt with by uh, private lawyers, but we need to make emphasis that any person that needs a lawyer can get that service in any state or department of the country. The public prosecutor office has an intercultural approach. In November the, on November the 30th, uh, 2020, there was a resolution according to which uh, private prosecutor uh, groups were prepared uh, with a specific aim on indigenous peoples for the different uh, communities in order to adapt our services to the geographical and cultural and socioeconomic conditions of those communities according to international standards of human rights. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, the uh, area of human rights and terrorism. We cannot hear you. Mm. 
Bloom, first of all, to explain, to express my condolences for the deaths of Erasmo Garcia Grau in the community of Sinchi Roca, as experienced, and Rios Gonzano from Puerto Nuevo community, and Esena Casanto from the native community of Chavin. Thank you, Vironi. Human rights defenders that were victims in February and March 2021. There are, there is an investigation in course currently ongoing about them. What has been shown in our organic law of Peru is that we have the obligation to persecute crimes and to defend the interests of the society. That's what we are doing in order to conduct the criminal investigation in the face of such a crime and ask for a sanction to be implemented and to have reparation for the damage caused. From our role, we are conducting the necessary actions so as to manage to clarify the facts and the damages not only about the three people mentioned before, but of the five victims last year as well as those victims of previous year, years, such as Edwin Chota, that had their rights vulnerated in terms of their fundamental rights. Some of them, for example, in terms of Arlindo Merendez, the investigation is just about to the, the the investigation stage is just about to be over in terms of Gonzalo Pia. The investigation is still ongoing, the preparatory phase, including the cases, so that the prosecutor can give his final statement. Secretary that coordinates the prosecutor's office in December 2020 upon the request of the meeting requested by the wife of Mr. Armendez, she came to the office and after listening to her and her concerns about the delays in the advance of this case, we notified the prosecutor's office that will conduct the administrative investigations as well against the prosecutors that were uh, creating the delays. And we make reference about this, not only to show respect for the victims and their family members, but it is, but because it is our obligation to make all necessary efforts within our jurisdiction and our capacity to find the truth in the case of these crimes. That's why we repeat our institutional commitment to clarify the facts, to identify the perpetrators, not only because it is our job, but also because we know the important efforts that the human rights defenders were all were doing have have always done. The Inter-American Commission has pointed out that the defenders are an essential and an essential part in order to create a sustainable and long-lasting society. And that's why when you affect a human rights defender, you affect the whole of the society. Therefore, we need to respond to the Inter-American Commission uh, in terms of the advances that we are conducting uh, addressing this issue. We are here to listen to the victims' requests and their family members' requests, and we are taking down note of many of the people who participate here in this system of human rights, we are going to follow up on these topics. Thank you. Okay, so are there any other comments on the state? Yes, yes. I would like to start by pointing out that we've taken down note and that we want to show our concerns about your requests that was done by the civil society, as well as by the issues raised by the commissioners. We've been here working for a little bit more than a hundred days 
And this is one of our priorities, what the director of the Ministry of Justice has just said. I mean, we've been working with this department for weeks now about the need to start from the assessment of this protocol and have a greater or a more robust framework which is related not only to the regulation itself, but also to a multi-sectorial participation. This provision needs to contribute to answering exactly those topics and having a better performance in the implementation or in, uh, the implementation of the measures. The early alert system, we believe it is essential to reduce the discretionality of these procedures in such a way that they can use a better methodological framework that ensures the rapid address uh, of these questions, of these issues. I would also like to point out that from the environmental sector, we believe it is essential to address the risk and the underlying causes, not only following the logic of addressing the threats, but also to improve the capacity of the environmental defenders to work in order to strengthen their jobs and their roles. The UNIDA, which is the environmental unit that we've recently created, is going to address these topics. Thank you. Thank you. And answering some of the questions of the commissioners, I will not be able to answer all of them because we will not have enough time, but we will send a written report on that. Mainly in terms of how the protection measures are shown, they are flexible to start with, but since we receive an alert message, that is to say, whenever there is a situation that we have to respond to, we organize a telephone coordination so that other entities of the state, for example, police departments, etc., we notify them of the possibility of intervention without activating the human rights defenders protocol yet. That is an intervention that we do regardless of the protocol. We know nowadays, thanks to the statistics, that the common issue in all the deaths of environmental leaders' deaths is the ones that are related to illegal mining, illegal felling, uh, and uh, illegal trafficking. They, our civil society uh, allies have already talked about it. This mechanism should be effective and should make the whole state intervene in, in this topic. The protocol is flexible, it depends on each case, and not all cases ask for the same. In the case of Marisol, that's a security issue. Now, there are other cases, uh, the first few cases where our presence in that area, in order to strengthen the protocol, our presence was welcome and was uh, acknowledged by the defenders. The protocol has, has undergone uh, serious tests in the pandemic because of specific areas such as the Amazonian region. Still, it needs to be updated, but it's been the first step, step towards something that wasn't existing, wasn't existent before. The, we made a diagnosis of the environmental defenders in a wide round table that we held last week. And we are focusing on the participation of all these members in the near future as part of the instruments that the Peruvian state has. We also ask for technical support in order to be able to support people in their period of sessions and in their debates. We are really interested in making the state support what has already been existing or what has, what has been created in order to defend human rights and environment defenders in Peru. This involves seven different sectors of the executive branch. We will create a new cycle in the advancement of these policies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, commissioners, the representatives 
all of the states that are part of this hearing, have they taken down note of the concerns that you've shown us? And we are willing to address these issues jointly and in an articulated manner, as it has been um, going on in the last four years with spaces for dialogue and discussion that are already existing and that give the possibility of many organizations and entities to join us in the effort to improve all this um, issues that we are trying to address. Thank you. Our gratitude to the representatives of the state for the valuable information that you've given us. From the Commission, I would also like to share that we are working in creating two guides, two guidelines that are very valuable. A practical guideline about recommendations for the creation of mitigation plans for risk mitigation for human rights defenders that will be published soon and the main guidelines for the investigation of crimes against defenders which is still in the process of being approved by the by the commission on behalf of the commission our gratitude our acknowledgement and our solidarity and commitment to your cause I would also like to emphasize the uh, technical support and solidarity to enforce the protocol and the mechanism for our commission. Human rights are an intrinsic part of the rule of law. There are no human rights without defense of human rights. There are no human rights without the right to defend your rights. Therefore, our commitment and our solidarity to the civil society, to the victims and to the state in their task of promoting the human rights. Thank you very much to the civil society, to the state, to my colleagues. And we will close this public hearing then. Thank you all very much. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone.